Okay, so I'm going to launch into the photography chapter, chapter nine. So here's the learning objectives. These are also in the book. Describe the early innovations that led to the development of photography. Explain the mechanics of the camera and outline the key adjustment photographers make when taking a picture. Discuss the influences on early art photography. Compare and use photography as art. Um, to its documentary function in society. I explain why artists did not commonly use color photographs before the 1970s, discuss experimental photographic processes used by a contemporary artist, and demonstrate the influence of digital technology on photography in the 21st century. So the first piece that we're going to take a look at is The Silence is Twice as Fast Backwards by Jane and Louise Willison. Um, this is a 2008 photograph and it's 72 by 72 inches so it's quite large um, so in this piece uh, Jane and Louise Wilson they actually captured a really magical moment in a lush green forest and it shows this wooded glade it's flooded with the streaking sunlight and like I said the picture is quite large it's actually six feet square and it fills the entire field of vision when you walk up to it actually on the wall because it's so large. So it fills your entire field of vision. And because of this, viewers can really be transported into the scene. So the word photography literally means uh, light writing or writing in light. Um, it can be either a practical tool or an art form and it has many uses which include photojournalism, science, advertising, and even personal record keeping. It also serves as a powerful means of expression though as well and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about a little bit more uh, in this chapter is the powerful means of expression that photography can convey. So there's a lot of choices about composition, angle, focus, distance, and even light when taking a picture. We're not used to this nowadays because we have camera phones and they pretty much do all of the work for us. But back in the day before we had camera phones or digital cameras even, you know, lots of considerations had to be made and lots of adjustments had to be made on the camera when taking a picture. So in the silence is twice as fat, fast backwards one, the three trees are perfectly positioned in the frame and there's a branch that leads our eye in from the lower left. So down here, and it kind of leads our eye in and it points towards the foliage of the second tree. And the branch at the lower right seems to parallel the one at the lower left in a ry rhythmic repetition. So these two are very similar angle, kind of got a little repetition there. And it does help lead your eye into some of the foliage from this other tree. So the curving branches lie at a roughly a 90 degree angle to the sun's rays that stream in from the upper left. So we have this angle here and this angle, and they're actually crossing each other. So the artist actually took some time and set the exposure of the shot perfectly. So we can see the details that are visible even in the intense light and darkness of this forest. So the setting on the camera that she chose really, she did it so that she could get all of that detail in the foliage and on the forest floor. And the artist was able to capture and create the effect of sunlight with the help of some mist. So she must have filtered in some mist to bring out the sun's rays in this, in this photo. So today we're covering how photography has evolved since the mid 19th century. So that's the mid 1800s from a tool uh, that they used for capturing the appearance of people or things or places into an actual established art form. And we will also consider its use as a tool for encouraging social change. So we're gonna talk about the evolution of photography now. We're gonna talk about one of the first cameras ever made which is the forerunner of the modern camera. It's called the camera obscura, which literally means dark room or dark chamber. So if you think of sunlight passing through a small hole in the wall of a darkened room, this sunlight will project onto the opposite wall and an inverted image will actually show on that opposite wall of whatever lies outside. 
So eventually there were a couple developments that were made to the camera obscura. They ended up adding in a lens and an angle mirror, which actually really helped out the ease of tracing. So this is kind of a process that didn't happen all at one time. It kind of started with a hole in a box basically. And then they ended up adding in that angled mirror on the inside with a lens on the hole. So several artists in the 17th century used tabletop versions of the camera, camera obscura to aid in drawing. And it really, at this point, has already functioned somewhat like a camera, but the means for preserving its images was yet to be discovered. So we'll take a look at uh, the first photograph every, ever taken at 1826. And it's a really vague photograph. It was made by Joseph Nice Four and he recorded and fixed it on a sheet of pewter that he exposed to the light. He put a sensitive material on top of that pewter plate and exposed it to the light for an entire day of eight hours. And you can see it's actually, oh, here's the camera obscura. So here's the room, the darkened room with the hole in the wall and whatever light coming from the outside, the imagery will actually come in and be an inverted image on the opposite wall. And then this is actually when they added in, oh, they haven't added anything in yet. This woman is actually, you know, she's using it as a tracing device. And then here's that tabletop version that ends up coming into use in the 17th century, which is the 1600s. And they've added the lens and the mirror and then there's actually this surface is what they would use to trace the image on. So this is that first photograph that we talked about earlier. Um, it's very grainy. And like I said, it was put on a metal plate and exposed for eight hours. And that metal plate had that photosensitive material, that light sensitive material on it that burned into the plate. It's really grainy. It's hard to make out what's going on, but you can see the faint shapes of a roof and maybe some walls. And it's basically a view from outside of Joseph's, Joseph's house. Um, so we can see why this photo is not really anything special, aesthetically speaking, but it's really neat to see literally like the first photograph that was ever made in either 1826 or 1827. And it's an upstairs window. So, and this was made, done in France. So during the next decade, the painter Louis Daguerre further improved the chemical process and produced some of the first clear photographs known as daguerreotypes. So he kind of changed the type of metal that was used. He used iodized silver plates in the presence of mercury vapor. So it was really, um, it was very toxic. And the images were fixed on the plate with a mineral salt solution. So combining this chemistry with the box size camera obscura yielded the first camera that gave really predictable results. Daguerre first publicized his work in 1839. At first exposure times were very long, so photography could only really record stationary subjects. So we'll take a look at a piece by Daguerre. It's called Les Boulevard du Temple from 1839. It's a daguerreotype, which is that silver plate with mercury vapor and mineral salt solution. It's from 1839. Let's take a look at that. So this is one of the first kind of predictable processes, the daguerreotype or daguer daguerreotype right here, um, named after its creator. So this is a picture of a street in 1839. And as you can see, there's not a lot of detail here, but actually there were people strolling up and down the street, up and down these sidewalks, horses, I'm sure, super busy town. But since all of them were moving so much, 
the only things that were recorded are stationary subjects. And actually, this one person was getting his shoes, sign, sh shoes shined. And you can actually see him right here. So there is there are several figures in this, and it's probably because he was standing there for long enough to actually show up in the photograph. He was stationary long enough. And this is in Paris. And the exposure time for this plate is thought to be about a half an hour. And this guy is definitely one of the, if not the first person, first human to show up in a photograph ever. And the first common use of photography was portraiture. So before the development of the camera, only the wealthy could really afford to hire artists to paint their portraits. It was kind of a expensive thing to hire out uh, an artist to paint your portrait. But with photography, it was so quick that it became actually something that a lot of more modestly, more modest people could afford. And by the mid 19th century, most major cities had several portrait photographers. So like I said, people of average means went in great numbers to photography free studios to sit. And they would have to sit stick really stiffly and they, they couldn't blink in bright sunlight for five to eight seconds to have their portraits made with these cameras. And as the 19th century progressed, shorter exposure times ended up happening, less toxic technology happened, and also printing on paper instead of metal all helped to really popularize photography. So we'll talk about the techniques of photography now. We'll talk about the modern camera. It still resembles a traditional camera obscura, and one can compare it to the human eye, honestly. The lens collects the light from whatever is out there and then the image passes through the dark chamber where it's collected upside down by the image sensor. So in traditional cameras, the sensor was either a chemically treated, treated plate, as with like a daguerreotype, or a chemical film. So film came after the chemically treated metal plates. And in today's digital cameras, a sensor converts the light into an electric charge which the camera's software reconstitutes as a photograph for display on the camera's screen. And this captured image can be basically stored on a memory card in the camera. So there are three different adjustments that photographers take when they take pictures. First, they adjust the focal length or the distance between the lens and the sensor. So that's Q in the diagram <clears throat> right here focal length. So you can actually zoom out the camera, bring it in or out. The lens, I mean. This is done by physically moving the lens inward or outward, or they call it zooming, by changing the lens or by digital means of the software. So it kind of depends on if you have a old school camera, then you actually physically move the lens. Or if you have a digital camera on your phone, let's say, you don't actually end up moving anything. It just kind of depends on on which type of camera you have.